Recording in progress. Samuel, you're good to go. Thank you, Georgie. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Such a great privilege for all of us to be in his presence, in the Lord's presence tonight. God gave the opportunity for us to remember his death and his resurrection. And we thank him for all his mercies. And as we prepare ourselves for the outreach program, my prayer is that tonight's message will equip us to be ready for the harvest. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious heavenly father, we thank you for filling us with your presence and helping us to continue to worship you through our listening. That we will be picking up the clear call outs from you that would require us to make the necessary course correction that we will become holier than where we are at right now. We pray that we will experience your loving kindness as we surrender ourselves to listen to this message. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There will be some key learning from the high priestly prayer from the Bible, as we are in the sixth part of our prayer series. The high priestly play, prayer is found in John chapter 17. So you can keep uh, that portion ready. There will be other portions we will look into, but that will be the primary portion we will be studying from. And a little bit of a caution. This will be an abstract kind of a message. Hence, paying full attention will certainly help. To get the most out of the message, keep the word of God in your hands and ask the Holy Spirit to explain things to you. We heard a part of the message during our singing time, during our communion time. So the prerequisites is as always, number one, the word of God in your hands. Number two, your ears and your hearts should be in the listening mode. Number three, Take as much notes as you can, that, that will help you. This week, again, I sent a few questions to my different study groups to seek their input. And as usual, a few of them responded. And here are the questions. What is a paradox? As you look at the question, you can think and come out with an answer in your mind so that you can validate some of the things we will be discussing tonight. What is a paradox? In the pre-service or the post-service, whatever, when we began, Joshua listed uh, whoever a few verses from the Bible. Some of them sounded paradoxical. Second question was, what 
is submission. What is submission? Third question. If you are a follower of Christ, then you will have to live like a monk. Is it true or false? If you are a follower of Christ, then you will have to live like a monk or none. The last question. What do you gain if you follow Christ? What do you gain if you follow Christ? The general outline of the message will have three S's. Three S's, like last time, three A's. Tonight, there'll be three S's. Number one is submission. Number two is solitude. Number three is sublime. Submission, solitude, and sublime. The assumption is one of the greatest paradoxes to some of our struggling minds. The assumption is that we understand that paradoxical statement from Philippians 1.21. To me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. With that, let's move on to our core message. John 17, verse 21, the second part. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. The first one, submission. The submissions of life. Let's stay, take a look at two verses and then build on it. Luke chapter 2, verses, verse 51. The first part of verse 51, Luke 2, 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. The next verse we want to see is John chapter 19, verse 11. Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. John 19, 11. Two things. You can see the core theme coming out of those two. And if, even if you struggle to get the core theme, just note them down and we will see how they are related in our learning. A couple, you can call them Nate and Nancy. Nate and Nancy enjoyed their stop at an omakase restaurant while visiting New York City. Omakase is a Japanese word that translates, I will leave it up to you, which means customers at such restaurants, let the chef choose their meal. Even though it was their first time to try this type of cuisine and it sounded risky, they loved the food the chef chose and prepared for them. What has this narrative anything to do with our message for tonight? Would you accept if I said that we are not built for ourselves, but for God? 
not for service for God, but for God. Listen carefully. We are not built for ourselves, but for God, not for service for God, but for God. That should explain the submissions of life. And he went down with them and was submissive to them. An amazing submission. For 30 years, Jesus lived at home with brothers and sisters who did not believe in him. And when he began his ministry, they said he was mad. His younger brothers and sisters, as he is, so are we in this world. We say, when I was born again, I thought it would be a great time of great illumination and service. And instead of that, I have had to stay at home with people who have criticized me and limited me on the right hand and on the left. I have been misunderstood and misinterpreted. The disciple is not above his master. Luke 640 reminds us that the disciple is not above his master. Do you think our lot ought to be better than Jesus Christ? We can easily escape the submissions if we like. But if we do not submit, the Spirit of God will produce in us the ghastliest humiliation before long. Knowing that Jesus has prayed for us makes us submit. God is not swayed by your aims and mine. He does not say, do you want to go through this bereavement, this upset? He allows these things for his own purpose. We may say what we like, but God does allow the devil. He does allow sin. He does allow bad men to triumph and tyrants to rule, as we see it all over the place. And these things either make us monsters or villains, or they make us saints. It depends entirely on the relationship we are in towards God. If we say, thy will be done, we get the tremendous consolation of knowing that our Father is working everything according to his own wisdom. Thy will be done. How long will it take for us to come to that level of submission? If we understand what God is after, we shall be saved from being mean and cynical in our behavior. The things we are going through are either making us sweeter, better, nobler men and women, or they are making us more devious and fault-finding, more insistent on our way. We are either getting more like our Father in heaven, or we are getting more mean and intensely selfish. How are we behaving ourselves in our circumstances, in our disappointments, in our delays? 
do we understand the purpose of our life as never before? Listen carefully. God does not exist to answer our prayers. God does not exist to answer our prayers. You get that right? But by our prayers, we come to discern the mind of God. And that is exactly what is declared in John chapter 17, verse 11. You have to look at your Bible if you want to draw the utmost benefit of this message. John 17, 11 says that they may be one, even as we are one. That they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus is praying this prayer to his father. That they, that they refers to us, that they may be one, uh, even as we are one. Am I close to Jesus as that? God will not leave me alone until I am. God has one prayer he must answer. And that is the prayer of Jesus Christ. It does not matter how imperfect or immature a disciple may be, if he or she will hang in, that prayer will be answered. Now your mind is racing in multiple directions. You want to be humble. You want to choose to walk in the way that pleases the Lord. As you look at your situation today, narrow may be the way you may be walking through. The narrow word, I'm intentionally using as it is defined in Matthew chapter seven, verses 13 and 14, which says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So are you walking in the narrow way? You're you find no companions, not many companions with you. There is solitariness, deafening silence. How do you react? Do you feel alone? That takes us to the second S of our message, solitude or the solitariness of life. Turn with me to Luke chapter four, verses one and two, to get a handle on what we are going to see under this heading. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, <clears throat> being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Jump to verse 42 of chapter 22, Luke 22, 42. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Both occasions, Jesus was alone. There was nothing to mark our Lord out from ordinary men, except the fact that he was insulated within. He did not choose 
the solitary places himself. He was driven by the spirit of God into the wilderness. It was, it is not good for a man to be alone. Evil will make a man want to be alone. Jesus Christ does not make monks or nuns. He makes men and women fit for the world as it is. Look at the 15th verse in John 17. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Keep them from the evil one. Speaking of monks, the 17th century monk, Brother Lawrence, probably some of you would have heard or read about him. Before a day's work as cook in his community, he would pray, oh my God, grant me your grace to stay in your presence. Help me in my labors. Possess all my affections. As he worked, he kept talking to God, listening for his leading and dedicating his work to him. Even when he was busiest, <clears throat> he would use intervals of relative calm to ask for his grace. No matter what was happening, he sought for and found a sense of his maker's love. Flip to Psalm 89 and see what it says. It confesses, Psalm 89 says this, the fitting response to the creator of all, who, ro who rules the oceans and is worshipped by hosts of angels. The fitting response to such a creator is to lift up our lives, our whole lives to him. You can be in the profession of Brother Lawrence, a monk serving as a cook in his community. But when we understand the beauty of God, who God is, we hear the joyful call to worship as it says in the 15th and 16th verses of Psalm 89, New Living Translation says, all day long. When we understand the power, the beauty of who God is, we will praise him all day long. We will hear the joyful call to worship all day long. Worship is not for Sunday alone. Whether it is standing in store or airport lines or waiting on hold on the phone minute after minute, our lives are full of moments like these. Times when we could easily get annoyed or these particular th things can be times when we catch our breath and see each of these pauses as an opportunity to learn to walk in the light of God's presence. Look at verse 15, Psalm 89, walk in the light of God's presence. You may be thinking, there's, there's a lot of wasted moments in my life. Even now, I'm going through one, you may say, the wasted moments of our lives. In your solitude, when we wait, 
or lay ill or wonder what to do next or all possible pauses to consider our lives in the light of his presence. We might say, I sincerely, I do wish Jesus didn't much of me. He expects nothing less than absolute oneness with himself. He was one with his father. He does not expect us to work for him, but to work with him. If you look at your life and compare your life with other people, this is what you will find. Every man carries his kingdom within. And no one knows what is taking place in another's kingdom. You say, no one understands me. Of course, they don't. Each one of us is a mystery. There is only one who understands you, and that is God. Hand yourself over to him. Are you being subjected in this internal kingdom to tremendous temptations? Jesus was tempted by the devil. Perhaps you are also, but no one guesses it. There's, there's never any friend for your soul when you are tempted. Temptation is the testing of the thing held. We hold from God the possibility of the answer to our Lord's prayer. And that's the line along which the temptation will come. Now look at John 17, 11. That will explain you clearly. Jesus has prayed that they may be one, even as we are one. Think of being one with Jesus, one in aim and purpose. The truth of the matter is, some of us are far off from this. And yet, God will not leave us alone until we are one with him. Because Jesus has prayed that we may be. There is a risk in discipleship. Because God never shields us from the world. The flesh and the devil. God never shields us from these things. So we need to understand while we live in this world, what we need to do. When we talk about the outreach program, there will be tremendous temptation in your life to showcase your talents rather than proclaiming Christ, Christ crucified. Christianity is character not a show business. Don't do anything that doesn't bring glory and honor to our triune God. If you are going through a solitary way, if you are dejected in your life, if you don't know which way to go, and if you are extremely frustrated with the things that are going on in your life, read John 17. It will explain exactly why you are where you are. Now, you are a disciple. You can never be as independent as you used to be. Jesus has prayed that you might be one with the Father as he is. Are you helping God to answer his prayer, the Lord's prayer? Or do you have your own agenda? 
let's go to the final S. But before that, a question. As you submit to God, embrace solitariness, the one we saw from Matthew 7, in order to be one with Christ, what can you expect? As you submit to God and obey his commands, and you are left alone to walk on the narrow way, what can you expect? Let's look at the first five verses of John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me <clears throat> in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Could you explain what this glory is? Look at verse five again. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. As we try to explain what this glory is all about, we may probably be struggling to explain it. The nearest word we may end up is sublime. What is sublime? It's a thing of outstanding spiritual, intellectual, or moral worth, according to the definition, dictionary definition, sublime. Verse 22 of John 17 says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Now we are in the picture that they may be one, even as we are one. And the glory which thou gavest me, King James says, I have given them. The glory of our Lord, as you think, as you meditate on it, you will know the glory of our Lord was the glory of a holy life. And that is what he gives to us. He gives us the gift of holiness. Are we exercising it? You might remember Hebrews 12, 14. Without holiness, no one can see the Lord. God gives us the gift of holiness that we may see his glory. Are we exercising it? He has given us the gift of holiness. As you took part in the communion, as you're sitting there, the Holy Spirit will bring in front of your eyes, what is going on in your life? How much is, is it your life close to this holiness that we are talking about that let you see the glory of God? After an astounding 30 rounds of radiation treatments, Darla was finally pronounced cancer free. As part of hospital tradition, she was eager to ring the cancer-free bell that marked the end of her treatment and celebrated her clean bill of health. Darla was so enthusiastic 
and vigorous in her celebratory ringing that the rope actually detached from the bell. People who were standing behind her were laughing. It was a joyful laughing. Dada's story should give us a sense of the psalmist who envisioned when he invited the Israelites to celebrate God's work in their lives. Look at Psalm 47 verses one and six. The Psalmist encouraged them to clap their hands, shout to God and sing praises because God had routed their enemies and chosen the Israelites as his beloved people. Joyful celebration. But we also need to understand God does not always grant us victory over our struggles in this life, whether health related or financial or relational. He is worthy of our worship and praise in even those circumstances because we can trust that he is still seated on his holy throne, Psalm 47, 8. God reigns over the nations. He is seated on his holy throne. When he does bring us to a place of healing, at least in a way we recognize in this earthly life, it is cause for great celebration. We may not have a physical bell to ring, but we can joyfully celebrate his goodness to us with the same kind of exuberance Dala showed. As you look into John 17, what is revealed there, if you could summarize, it is the hope of his calling, the hope of his calling. And it is the great light on every problem. God grant that we may remain true to that calling. There is so far you had seen as applicable to each one of you in many different ways, you could pick what were the application the Lord is giving you. But as we wind down our message, there will be one key thing perhaps will be applicable to all of us. John 14, 23, Jesus says, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. King James Version says, we will come to him and make our abode with him. The triune God abiding with the believer. Can you imagine that? The God, the creator of the universe, the triune God abiding with me, with you, with every believer. What does a man need to care after that? As you submit, as you walk in solitude, you will get this sublimity of life that God is abiding with you. Here is one challenge I would leave with you tonight from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 
verse five, as we close down our message, take a look at this and answer the question. In the light of what we heard, that the triune God is abiding with me, with you, with every believer. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse five. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves? that Jesus Christ is in you. What a powerful statement. Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Would you join me in examining ourselves, whether we can confidently experience that the triune God is abiding with us? Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for the high priestly prayer that you have given us. With your prayer that we as human beings, as believers may be one, as you and the Father are one. We thank you for the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that we understand that God would have to answer your prayer, that we will be united with you, and that the triune God will be abiding with us forever. And if that is the case, O oh Lord, help us to look into our lives and see how much of the holy life that you have imparted to us we are experiencing and we are ex exercising even as we prepare to celebrate the joyful occasion of your resurrection and plan to invite our friends to hear the good news of the gospel. Help us, Lord, to bring honor to your name by the way we walk, by the way we talk. And if we do not have submission in our lives, we pray that we will learn to submit and help us to choose the narrow way to walk in. And we pray that we will understand what this glory that you are talking about in John 17. We thank you, Lord. We pray that this week will be a week in which we enjoy your presence while inviting people to know Christ. We thank you for equipping us. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen.